Good evening. My name is Debbie Douglas and I'll be your MC for tonight and tomorrow. Welcome to Color of Poverty, Color of Change 10th anniversary and celebration and our third conference, Racial Justice Leading the Change. It is so good to look out and see you all here at six o'clock on a Tuesday evening after a long weekend. As you can see, we have our ASL interpreters here this evening, and so if you need them um, and, you, and this side isn't working for you, just put up your hand and we will accommodate you. Thank you for being here. Before we get started and before I introduce our elder who will bring our land acknowledgement, um, I do want to do some housekeeping. Uh, first, the fun part, there will be a reception following this evening's panel, so we will get to chat with each other informally and have some good food and drinks. Unfortunately, it's all non-alcoholic for those of you who like a good glass of white wine um, at the end of the day. Um, there are washrooms on the main floor just behind the cafe, so out this door and to your left. Um, well, yeah, to my left. Um, and also on the lower floor where our breakout groups will be tomorrow morning. We have a filming and photography policy and I'm looking to see if there are any signs. I don't see any signs yet, but registration means that you've given us permission to take your, to videotape you and to take your photograph. We promise it will not be used for any commercial purposes. It will be used for COPSI um, purpose, however. Tomorrow we will have a sign saying that if you do not want to be photographed, please speak to the person, to the photographer, or we will have a sign saying where it is that you can sit. So for tonight, if you see anyone with a video camera or with a, a still camera, do this or just whisper to them and say, please do not take my photograph. Um, we're encouraging you to tweet, to do Facebook, to use our hashtag, um, hashtag races, R-A-C-E-S, capital E-D, J2, J2018. That's hashtag races, capital E-D, J2018. Got that? And of course, we have Wi-Fi that's available, so you can tweet and Facebook and Instagram and all those other things that people do online. Um, and the ID is Events Law, and it's on the side of the of the um, it's on here, and you will see these signs throughout um, the floor. So it's it, the ID is Events Law, all small ca all small letters, and the password is May 2018. May as in the month 2018. Okay, so that's it for housekeeping. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Elder Ernie Sandy, keeper and teacher of indigenous culture, heritage, and history. Elder Ernie was born on the semi-isolated First Nation called Christian Island or Chim Nissing, Big Island, located on Georgian Bay in the 1940s. He was raised by his grandparents, Mike and Catherine Sandy, both full-blooded members of the Anishinaabeg Nation even to this day, he gives thanks to his grandparents, who in his early childhood and years, who, who in his early childhood years and teenage years bestowed upon him the heritage, history, language, culture, and way of life sp through spirituality, as well as the customs and the beliefs of the Anishinaabe world. Being raised in a community, sorry, drawing upon the lessons of life from his grandparents, he still maintains an old traditional way of learning that the thirst for knowledge, life, and work experience are gained by drinking from the cup of curiosity. In other words, you'll never know until you ask or until you try it. With that in mind, Ernie feels honored having quenched the thirst of hundreds of students with their questions along with, along with interest groups and friends many times over in the last six decades. He's a very strong advocate of higher education. Over the past 25 years, Ernie has taught indigenous courses or classes at Nipissing, York Glendon College, Lakehead, the University of Waterloo, OISE here at U of T, St. Mary's College, First Nations Technical Institute, and Georgian College in Aurelia and Barrie. 
He continues to share the unique philosophy and history of the indigenous peoples to this day through presentations and guest speaking. Ernie is em empathic in saying that one of the primary benefits of the increased knowledge is, is intolerance of bigotry and racism. As educators, parents, grandparents, and society in general, there is an opportunity to seek social and moral justice. Racism will never disappear, but this cannot stop a movement designed to create a whole new world of racial intolerance for today's children and their children's children. As the indigenous peoples and others emerge from the dark shadow of spiritual and moral destitute, they are healing holistically. They are healing in their own way and in their own time and their own pace. While it may take one or two generations for indigenous people to, cover, to recover from three centuries of isolation and racism, they are resilient and unrelentless in this pursuit of moral and social justice. And I'll end there. Please join me in welcoming Elder Ernie Sandy. Thank you very much. It's an honor to uh, be a part of this uh, very important uh, gathering in terms of uh, recognizing, uh, I guess, a diversity and also, I guess, an intolerance that uh, you know, is um, amongst the general population. I want to start off um, by a few quotes, a few quotes of, uh, I call them anti-racism, uh, famous anti-racism uh, quotes. Beginning with, um, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or religion. People learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can learn to love. For love comes more naturally of the human heart than of the opposite. Nelson Mandela. The best way to and discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discrimination on the base, basis of race. John Roberts, Roberts, sorry. And achievement has no color. One of the things I just want to uh, make a comment on that, uh, that one there. Um, to me, uh, academic achievement was based on my determination and knowing that I had a right to be in university and to know that it's not about my race that made me want to go, to, to have that um, uh, unrelentless pursuit of education. And it is through that um, that I also encouraged other indigenous people and others as well to, to seek further education as much as possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next one is, um, next quote is, hating people because of their color is wrong. And it doesn't matter which color does the hating, hating. Is this wrong, Muhammad Ali? Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Martin Luther King Jr. <clears throat> this next quote, I remember being made back in 1963. I remember hearing it. I remember. Uh, Encompassing what, what, what Martin Luther was saying, I believe, and uh, excuse, I forgot where it was in Washington, but uh, over 400,000 people were listening, listening to a movement at that time. And uh, like there's a whole, uh, I got the whole speech, but I'm not going to do it here. But just to give you an idea of, um, of the, uh, um, the quote that caught my um, ear. And also will, I guess it'll be the foundation of, um, 
many of our dreams and to see that and to uh, recognize and to seek um, moral and social justice. And here's what I sort of the, um, uh, I, I would say that not at the crutch of, at crutch of the uh, entire, I have a dream that my four ch little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. Martin Luther King Jr. With that, um, I mean, we want, we want things for our children, those who come behind us, those who walk in our footsteps, those who see us witness that uh, live, uh, I guess, living the racism that uh, we were born into. When I was going through high school, when I was going through public school, um, there was racism that you wouldn't believe. And, um, and through all that, uh, I give thanks to my grand grandparents who gave me the, the spiritual strength to believe in myself, to have that armor of spiritual, uh, spirituality. Yes, I, uh, those names hurt. Yes, that bigotry hurt. Yes, that uh, bigotry angered me. But at the same time, I recognize that racism is born at home. I was just sharing there with uh, one of the um, person there a the while ago, just that uh, if you put um, seven, five or six, seven, different babies in a crib, they will all pull, play together because they don't know. They haven't been introduced into the idea of racism, of indifference. Something that uh, you know, we live with today, um, when Debbie mentioned uh, I, uh, in, in my bio that racism will not disappear, but at the same time, uh, part of it is, uh, as this gathering here is uh, an example of, uh, you know, just to, um, uh, to educate people. You know, I've um, had the honor, um, uh, now for years and years and years, uh, 20, 25 years, to do guest lectures. And I find that the students are thirsty for knowledge. They want to know. Why is it that there's such social and economic disparity within the First Nations? And also as well, too, the discrimination that um, goes across all, all, all races. And, you know, and I tell them that, you know, why is there so much suicide? Why is there so much poverty? Why is there so much uh, anger? Why is there so much, you know? And uh, my answer to that is, you know, you take away a people's land. You take away a people's children. You take away a people's language, identity, culture, dignity. What do you have left? You know, um, when I look at um, I look at my uh, um, people as well as others, uh, you know, facing racism. You know, it's something that uh, you know. It's here, and it us, and it us uh, individuals here. Uh, to be able to say that, uh, you know, um, yes, racism is there, but let us not, let us not uh, um, allow that to pull us down. Let us walk together in spiritual, spiritual brotherhood and sisterhood. This is what, uh, you know, um, I've been uh, teaching, I've been uh, advocating all along that, uh, you know, uh, each and every one of us, regardless of, uh, you know, race or uh, nationality or, you know, whatever, we are a pride. We're the pride. We're the pride of our nation. We're the pride of our culture. We're the pride of our heritage. It's something that we should hold strong here. I do that. I can stand up here and say, I am a proud Anishinaabe. I'm proud Anishinaabe. And to really mean it from the heart. That's where, that's where I, I walk. I walk and walk proud that I am um, Anishinaabe. Snobby, and I'm proud, uh, proud to be, you know, and I, and I, uh, uh, everyone here that can echo that, to be proud in who you are, proud, because when you're proud, your children will be proud, 
the grandchildren will be proud. They will see that uh, there is a world for us. There is a world for everyone. This is what uh, you know. I just want to um, uh, to share with you briefly, and um, I also want to briefly share. I'm glad to. Um, my first language was uh, my language Ojibwe. I had to learn English after, and um, I just want to share a little bit of uh, my language with you. Basically, what I'll be saying is uh, I'm glad to um, glad to uh, don't have the opportunity to give just a glimpse, a glimpse of the, um, I guess, the uh, dark shadows of, in, of the indigenous world. Yes, it is the, it's gradually uh, there's a light shining upon, upon us where we have powwows, we have dancing, we have, um, we have uh, we're, we're finding our medicines again, we're finding our, you know, our, we're finding our ways. You know? uh, so just a little bit of thing I'll be saying that, after we get to know Nanibuyan, Mabichabam Gaki on the King Ektayan, Kinon Nidin Gokinwa, Kinwa Inchi Ekma, Mimanda Win Shishing, Tizon Gabwing, Mandagona Kea Chichamusing, Mil Mimanda Nishna Gokio, Kinwen Kina, Kinwe Doktarian, Kinagnundi, Kinamanda King Eshanendagok. When I put my um, hands together like that, what I'm symbolizing is the um, sisterhood and brotherhood of all nations, of all people, of all, you know, we walk together. And I often say to the students, um, sometimes the students from all over the world, I said, if this, if the lights went out, we'd all be the same color. It's, it's in what's in what's in our mind. It's in what's in our mind of the general public that, that um, I guess, um, uh, allows them to be indifferent, but to um, but to accept everyone as they are. This is what humanity is all about. This is what um, I guess uh, gradually um, uh, seeking seeking directions in terms of uh, you know um, what we want to uh, leave for the next generation. And uh, one of the things that I just want to um, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me, and you know, and uh, something that uh, oh, to me, Gretchen, that's a uh, thank you in my language. Uh -huh. <laughs> Elder Ernie asked me if he stuck to his time. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Elder Ernie. Um, we do appreciate the messages that you have um, brought to us this evening. We recognize that this gathering is taking place on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the most recent stewards of these lands and territories, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. These lands and territories are part of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. More recently, these lands and territories have been covered by the Toronto Purchase Treaty and Williams Treaties between First Peoples, the Crown, and settler society more generally. In addition to the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Toronto area is home to many indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We are grateful for this opportunity to meet and work in a good way and in recognizing that there, is, that there are locally relevant land claims negotiations still on the way, at the minimum with respect to the Toronto Islands. We together set an intention and commitment to approach our work in a spirit of real and meaningful reconciliation, equity, and racial justice. Thank you. And now for the main event of the evening. It is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Kikiola Roach, better known as Kike. Um, will the panelists please join me up as I read Kike's um, bio and then Kike will introduce the panel. Kike Roach is the Unifor Sam Gindan Chair in Social Justice and Democracy at Ryerson University. 
She studied law at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and at University Jean Moulin in Lyons, France. As a lawyer, she has been an advocate for accountability and reform in policing and detention centers for many years. She has represented individuals in civil lawsuits against the state and has appeared at all levels of court, including as assistant counsel at the Supreme Court of Canada. Kike is co-author of the book, Politically Speaking, on feminism and Canadian politics. She has appeared frequently in the media as a spokesperson on social justice issues and has led workshops for the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, United Steel Workers, and the Canadian Labour Congress. Kike has served as, as an executive member of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women and Organizations We Need to re Reform, and the Women's Coalition for Employment Equity and the National Conference of Black Lawyers, among other community organizations. Please join me in welcoming Kike Roach. Oh, thank you so much, Debbie, and good evening to all of you. Bonjour, bonsoir, good evening. I come from a call and response community, so I need to hear you say, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, yes. I, I want to feel your energy in the room. And I'm so delighted to be here. I'm really honored to be part of this 10th anniversary celebration, this third provincial forum brought to you by Color of Change, Color of Poverty. And today is really a special day. It's a special day anytime we get together and we allow ourselves, we give ourselves that important, crucial time and space that we need to come together, to commune, to think about the issues that really touch us in our day-to-day -day, day -day lives, in our day-to-day -day work. And so I'm really honored to be here with this amazing group of panelists to get us started in thinking about some of the important issues that face us in, this, in these times. And I want to say thank you to Debbie, um, uh, Debbie Douglas. I want to say miigwech, thank you very much to Elder Ernie Sandy. And I want to say thank you to all of the people who put time and energy and effort and thought into organizing this, um, this forum. And there's so much for us to talk about, but it's really a time to also say congratulations. Congratulations to Color of Change, Color of Poverty. It's a time to say congratulations to an organization that for over the last 10 years has worked really hard to create space, to talk about race, to talk about racial justice in public discourse with community groups, with public institutions, the media, political leaders, grassroots community organizations, and to bring us together knowing that together we're stronger. And this is a time for us to have this in important conversation that's a time of change, a time of uncertainty, a time to talk about truth and reconciliation. And Color of Poverty, Color of Change has been there to lead these conversations um, over this past, past decade, to engage us in reflections about violence um, as it faced all of our communities, the uh, horrific phenomenon of missing and murdered Indigenous women, the need to honour our treaties and to end the discrimination of the Indian Act, to talk about racialized inequities in the labour market, to talk about things like data collection and a national action plan against racism, to talk about the needs of temporary foreign workers and um, immigration detention and um, how we've been over-policed and underserved and over-incarcerated and underrepresented and overcrowded and underpaid and whether it is um, it, it, on any of these fronts, color of change a color of poverty, color of change has been there to move these conversations from the margins um, into the center. And so joining us tonight is from your uh, far right, first Courtney Skye. Courtney Skye is a Mohawk woman from the Turtle Clan from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. She is a passionate advocate for the rights of indigenous women, girls, trans, queer, and two-spirit people. 
And throughout her career, she's worked on many initiatives within government and community, including child welfare reform, ending violence, and removing sexism from the Indian Act. And through robust gender-based analysis, community accountability, and rights-based approaches, Courtney strives to end all forms of systemic violence. Sitting next to Courtney um, is Angela Robertson. Angela joined the Queen West Center as executive direct director in 2013. And um, she has over 20 years of leadership experience fostering partnerships with community health centers. Um, she has worked as the Director of Equity and Community Engagement at Women's College Hospital, and she was also Executive Director at Sistering, a Woman's Place, for over 11 years, which was an organization um, focused on providing basic needs, housing and counseling services to low-income, homeless and at-risk women. Um, Angela's bio goes on and on, <laughs> as does that of all of our panelists. Um, but in the interest of time, I will just tell you that she's also a current member of the Stephen Lewis Foundation, and she's the uh, co-editor of the book Scratching the Surface, um, Canadian Anti-Racist Feminist Thought. Um, sitting next to Angela is Rizwan Mohammed. And Rizwan is the National Youth Coordinator with the Canadian Council of Muslim Women. Rizwan is a graduate of the University of Toronto, specializing in Islamic theology. Um, he educates Canadian Muslims and the general public about Islam and coordinates youth-led community building projects with um, the CCMW. Rizwan's work focuses on addressing the challenges of racism, poverty, and militarism through mobilizing young people to engage in experimental activities to strengthen civil society. And he does a lot of work on uh, media ethics and environmental justice as well. Sitting next to Rizwan, it, we are joined by Beverly Jacobs, who is Mohawk of the Bear Clan. Beverly Jacobs lives and practices law at her home community of Six Nations of the Grand River Territory in southern Ontario. And Professor Jacobs is a consultant, a researcher, a writer, a public speaker. Um, she's currently completing an interdisciplinary PhD at the University of Calgary. And she is the former elected president of the N uh, Native Women's Association of Canada. Um, she has... Um, over the past 20 or so years, done a lot of work focused on anti-violence and restoring indigenous traditions, values, beliefs, and laws. She advocates for families of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and for public education about the history and impacts of colonization. She, her work has been widely recognized, including internationally, where she has won numerous awards. And she's also a proud mother and grandmother. Um, and joining us by Skype um, is the Honorable Kim Pate. She'll, she'll join us um, in a mom momentarily. Um, as she's doing double duty tonight. She's also working and um, joining us as soon as she can. Um, and the Honorable Kim Pate is a nationally renowned advocate who spent the last 35 years working in and around the legal and penal systems of Canada with and on behalf of some of the most marginalized, victimized, criminalized, and institutionalized, particularly imprisoned youth, men, and women. She was appointed to the Senate of Canada in 2016, and she's taught law at various universities, University of Ottawa, Dalhousie, Saskatchewan, and she was the notably the director, um, executive director of the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies from 1992 until 2016. Please join me in giving a rousing welcome to all of our wonderful speakers tonight. So I have to admit it, I am afraid I do not know what's going to happen on June 7th, as none of us do, but by what the papers tell us, we could either be welcoming in a uh, progressive-leaning government that will nevertheless need to be um, shepherded to the right way on so many policies and issues and actions that we have talked about over many, many years, 
or we could be needing to huddle here again for the resistance um, to uh, what is possibly going to be uh, a trump light government here in Ontario. But we, as we move into this period of elections on every single level, provincial, municipal, federal, whether we participate in the electoral system or not, some of us out of um, disgust, resist and don't participate. Some of us, this is not actually our form of government and therefore we don't participate. But nevertheless, we know that all of us will be impacted by the next wave of new or old politicians who continue to have dramatic impacts on all of our communities. Um, so as we grapple with, or as I reflect myself on this mix of emotions that we see right now, we've had um, just a whole slew of headlines in the news over the past year, especially this intense period of time when we've gone through what was supposed to be a celebration of a nation that we, we know was founded in uh, genocide and uh, the ripping away of so many people's rights. Um, and yet, nevertheless, here we are gathered together, many of us in this room having not seen some victories, um, have, having been able to establish um, some community organizations and build some and forge some alliances amongst each other that have been fruitful and wonderful and something for us to celebrate. Um, there's much for us to, to think about. So I'm wondering, in all of this, Courtney Skye, um, what is preoccupying you right now? Um, what is uh, at the forefront of your mind and heart? And can you tell us a little bit of what you're working on? And then I'd like to ask each one of the panel members to answer the same question. So I think what's been uh, top of mind for me is I was really struck with some remarks I heard um, from Cindy Blackstock a, a few months ago. And, and she pulled out, uh, we were at a, a meeting and, and she pulled out a stack of reports that were written between the 70s and 80s and she read from these reports and, and noted that this a lot of the recommendations that were made in these reports were were similar if not same same to what um, you know are being studied right now and so uh, I've been uh, struck with the idea of rereading reports from the 70s and into the early 90s that are much uh, before my policy life but I've been I've been studying them and, and thinking about them and um, and what does it mean for all of these ideas that have never been implemented over the past so many years? And, and one of the things that really struck me was, um, I've been reading about the Fourth World Conference on Women, which happened in Beijing in 1995, and there's a set of robust recommendations in that report. But one of the things they talked about in that report is that political mobilization is the catalyst in which social and cultural change is made sustainable for women. And I think that has been really lost in a lot of our conversations around, you know, rights affirming or improving the socio and economic status of women in our societies is this lack of this catalyst of political mobilization. And so I think it's timely now that we're in, you know, another election season and another election cycle. Um, but I've been thinking about what that means, you know, to sustainably um, make progress into the, the well-being of women and, and what does that mean not just for um, people who may or may not be able to vote or choose to vote within this particular election, but what does it mean to empower uh, you know, different groups of women to be able to be engaged in civil society in all, various forms of decision making, not just um, it, you know, in one instance of voting, but in uh, you know the realm of civil discourse that's available to all citizens. And it, so I think that's been the complex ideas that I've been really trying to digest. And then how do we um, translate this into uh, the most marginalized in our community so that they can see themselves and, and their voice being heard and reflected? And, and for um, indigenous organizations, how do we affirm that for people to not speak for people, but to honor the voice especially that Indigenous women have, uh, to speak for themselves, to, to address their own needs, and to uh, pursue their aspirations. Um, so I feel like we've been here before, <laughs> um, in that uh, um, there are many of us in this room who lived through Mike Harris, and that we're still in recovery, one would say, 
um, because the cuts to social assistance that were made um, were never reinstated by any subsequent government. Um, but scared, yes. Um, but I think inspired because if we are to roll back and continue to roll back on um, kind of a progressive um, state politic with this coming election is that that is also happening amidst uh, those social movements. Yeah. Um, it's happening amidst um, movement around Idle No More. It's happening amidst a movement around Black Lives Matter. It's happening around movements still that one talks about as the 1% and the anti-1%. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a class consciousness, a class consciousness politic um, that exists. So, um, so I'm hopeful that what will happen is those movements will be emboldened um, to continue to be more strident in speaking back to a rolling back of the things that we have fought for. But what I'm also um, reminded of, um, and I think for this conversation, is that anything that we have won in terms of rights that are affirmed by the state is always precarious, and that we must always be vigilant in defending, um, retaining them, mm -hmm and that so the state gives is so the state can take back. Um, because of the nature of electoral politics, that's really not always grounded in the thing that I think we are here talking about, that is justice. Yeah? Um, is it's really sometimes grounded in the vote and a kind of an electoral politics about what is the politic thing at the moment that can provide a vote not necessarily what is the thing at the moment that can provide sustained justice. Um, so, but, but hopeful nonetheless. Um, and lastly, um, I would say that there are the, the, the movements for social justice and social change um, are happening from the ground up um, in that there was a time when we didn't see folks risking taking to the streets. Um, but that is not the time that we're in, in that um, folks are at the streets um, in protest. Um, and that I think that will be more galvanized um, as we see the possibility of what you call kind of a Trump light um, government. Um, but I think it will also be an unmasking. It will be an unmasking of can Canada's racism, mm -hmm. um, of Canada's um, conservative politic. We saw that at the end of the last federal election when there were government politician leaders who made all kinds of um, racist statements and some people were aghast and some of us who are in this room were like, yeah, it's just the thing that we know is always sitting out there. Mm -hmm. Um, that is now unveiled. So we may see more of that unveiling. Thank you, first of all, to uh, Color of Poverty, Color of Change for including me in this discussion. I'm sort of uh, new to this circle, and so I'm, I'm very grateful to be part of this conversation with um, people who are so knowledgeable as, as the uh, brilliant women uh, on this panel. Um, about the election, I, I want to agree with uh, the points raised by Courtney and, and Angela, and uh, maybe just add uh, something that's sort of concerning me very specifically with the young women that I'm working with. I, I work with Muslim women, I work with non-Muslim women, I work with uh, young men uh, and, uh, who are Muslim and non-Muslim and so forth. And uh, one of the things that uh, I'm seeing from some of the young Muslim women in, in this uh, election that's, that's very concerning to me is that some of the ones that are doing uh, s some of the most effective uh, youth engagement at the grassroots mm. are um, getting very disillusioned uh, at their, the choices before them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was talking to a few young women recently uh, who were expressing their disillusionment to me and I asked them um, if they, 
were very skeptical that they could um, that they could make a choice. I, I was I was suggesting, you know, it's possible, even though it's it's a lot harder to sift through a lot of the, you know, the um, misinformation and the confusion. It's possible to get informed sufficiently adequately to make a choice for the least worst option, maybe. <laughs> and uh, they were not having it from me. They said uh, there's too much deception for them to make any choice that would be meaningful to them. And I didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I felt very stuck. Uh, and then further, I met um, a, a young woman uh, who's a political science student finishing her degree in Toronto. And um, she uh, is brilliant and um, kind of radical progressive person who extre who's extremely critical. I knew her for a few years through her undergrad. And I knew her to be extremely critical of electoral politics to the point that I thought there was no way she would get involved. But I was so happy to learn that she got involved uh, to support uh, a progressive candidate in her riding and work on that candidate's campaign. The thing that concerned me was is that with uh, just last week, she called me saying that um, people seem to not be interested in relationships and building uh, for the long term. Uh, beyond whether whatever the outcome of this uh, of the vote ends up being, mm -hmm. and there seemed to be too much emphasis on optics and um, visibility and and things that she thought were not worth spending time on, and she quit the campaign. Oh. She told me she was quitting the campaign, and she just asked me, "Am I being unreasonable?" She talked through a bunch of options with me, and she quit the campaign. So I was very concerned that uh, this person was. Um, maybe under-supported and, and lacked uh, role models, lacked uh, adequate uh, uh, guidance to find a pathway to stay involved uh, in terms that made sense to her. Um, so those, those are things that I'm, I'm kind of dealing with uh, lately mm -hmm. during this election cycle. Okay. Well, first I want to um, acknowledge the, um, the elder and your your opening statements and your prayer and, and recognition of the uh, of the work that uh, that we need to do and continue to do, and also um, I think I have been around uh, <laughs> color of poverty and color of change for a while now, and um, and want to congratulate them for all of the work that they do as well in the ten years uh, of. Uh, non-stop I would say of work that has had to be done so for me my focus has not been the election <laughs> mm -hmm. um, my work has been um, uh, in the last uh, year uh, with my uh, finishing up my my dissertation so I just submitted that two weeks ago so that's still in <laughs> still in my brain <laughs> So I just want to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it uh, the title of it is uh, The Impacts of Resource Development on Holistic Health in uh, community Mohawk Community of, of Akwazasne. And, um, and it's been uh, nine years uh, in the works uh, since I started in September of 2009 and working with the community. And one of the requirements of uh, working with community um, is to ensure partnership because that w that's one of the things with uh, indigenous communities is that uh, we've been researched to death. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the community of Akwazasne has been very um, forward thinking and uh, I think the, uh, uh, the environmental uh, task force uh, created its own ethics uh, guidelines and they're all PhDs themselves who are part of that committee and had encouraged and said to uh, the University of Calgary that uh, I wouldn't graduate without an elder being on my committee uh, from the community so that was one of the requirements and so the elder sat on and is sitting and he's actually the the director of environment in the community and 
Um, and so it's been a very powerful uh, process with the community and um, one of the uh, developments uh, within the dissertation is the development of uh, Haudenosaunee research methodology um, and developing a process uh, of how we gather research um, and also a theory and I called it the Gaswenta theory where we uh, part of the whole Gaswenta theory was um, that we respected each other as nations um, and so with respect to the um, the Haudenosaunee research methodology um, part of understanding that also was my own how I fit into that being Mohawk and being Haudenosaunee and being a researcher and being a lawyer in your own community is um, a lot of work. Probably more work than uh, a non Haudenosaunee person would because of the uh, ongoing responsibilities of uh, developing trust and ensuring our relationship is uh, is established and so that was a really um, powerful process um, and as I'm finishing and going through one of the things that I didn't realize uh, while I was ending and finishing up the final chapter of my dissertation was I was talking about self-determination and sovereignty and nationhood and that holistic health, according to Haudenosaunee peoples, is, is holistic. It includes health, it includes law, it includes education, it includes our social systems, it includes our laws. And so part of that whole um, understanding and learning through, through these nine years with the community and with my own community is is coming full, full circle and coming full circle back to what my elders and my people, my elders and everyone who has taught me about sovereignty and self-determination, um, that we have a responsibility as Indigenous people. And so what ended up becoming uh, with Gaswenta theory was that according to Haudenosaunee laws is our responsibilities. And once we start talking about Eurocentric law, it became about rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a right to this, I have a right to that. And so according to Haudenosaunee law, we have a responsibility to everyone and to all of creation. And when we're practicing our laws, that we are healthy. And, and it's also connected to the land. So holistic health wasn't just physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. It was also about connection to land and water. And so there's so much um, within the, the dissertation, um, I could probably develop 10 years of, of courses um, just from, from it. Um, and so that's what also what I've been doing as well as developing courses at uh, the Faculty of Law, um, the University of Windsor. And we now have a new uh, mandatory uh, Indigenous Legal Traditions course at the Faculty of Law. So all first year law students will um, learn indigenous legal traditions. So I found my space, I found my place um, at the University of Windsor. It's been a very powerful um, relationship. And that's what I'm finding with everything is, is about this healthy relationship because that's what Gus Wenta is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Gus Wenta is about having healthy relationships with each other and on both sides and that we also need to, to know what that means to be healthy um, and our relationship to the land and water. So thank you. Yeah.
Thank you very much. I, I want to come back to your point about um, developing those healthy relationships sure. in a moment, but I understand that we are now joined by the Honourable Senator Kim Pate. Can you hear us? I can, oh, yes. wonderful. Thank you, Senator Pate. Um, we introduced you uh, earlier, um, and the question that we've been talking about with our panel members has been, um, as we move in this period of this very electoral period of provincial, municipal, and federal elections that are on, on our heels um, that will usher in uh, a wave of new and old politicians that will have dramatic impacts across all of our various communities. I'm asking as an opening question, what is preoccupying you right now? Um, what are you working on at the moment? And um, what is it that is foremost um, in your heart and mind at this time. Great, thank you very much. And uh, my apologies for the delay. We had a couple of standing votes because it's silly season here in uh, <laughs> uh, the unceded Algonquin territory and in the particular area that's still the subject of a land claim. But um, so thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I couldn't hear everybody. I'm going to uh, try and go back and listen to those of you who I missed. and. Um, um, thank you to all of you who are there, and I'm very sorry not to be with you in person. But in terms of some of the things that, I, uh, that I'm um, pretty concerned about at municipal, federal, and provincial levels is the extent to which the inequality that is experienced by um, many people, particularly those who are uh, marginalized by race, uh, by gender, um, and obviously uh, by class as well, um, and ability and basically at every, you know, the, the intersections of those um, discriminatory uh, experiences are more likely to be experiencing, um, the, are more likely to be marginalized further and further. And, and one of the reasons that um, when I was approached to consider this um, position, one of the reasons that I was interested in it was when I started thinking about um, the work that I've been doing for many years and the fact that there, our prisons are uh, full of poor people, um, overwhelmingly racialized people, particularly indigenous, but increasingly African Canadian, as well as Asian and South Asian and Indo Canadian. And as we started, um, as I started looking at that, I also realized that the, for, uh, the fastest growing prison population being women, particularly indigenous women, and those who are escaping violence, as well as those who were experiencing uh, mental health issues often related to the trauma of the violence they'd experienced, um, it became clear that one of the roles of the Senate is to represent what's often referred to as minority interests. I prefer to think of those who are marginalized or dispossessed or oppressed, um, and to look at issues that are beyond the electoral cycles. And so, um, you know, it's a tired phrase sometimes, but the, the Chamber of Sober Second Thought is supposed to be looking at that and, and so the long area. And so some of the areas that um, a number of us are particularly interested in is are things like guaranteed livable incomes, not just guaranteed income or basic income, but actually getting rid of the notion of social assistance and the, the use of um, the, you know, the concept of deserving poor or um, and bootstraps arguments, but really um, stopping the policing of income and instead guaranteeing um, a, a base, uh, guaranteed livable income for people as well. Free post-secondary education, free pharmacare, free health care, free mental health care, free dental care. All of the things that we know, those who are um, who are, have the uh, greatest degree of marginalization have the least access to, and all of the things that are, you know, sometimes called social um, or economic determinants of health, but they're also the social and economic determinants of who is criminalized and imprisoned in this country and others as well. And so really looking at, in the long term, dealing with those issues and uh, develop, going beyond even what um, the Canada Assistance Plan did before it was dismantled, and and really looking at how do we actually raise the standard of living of those who um, who don't experience that standard at this time. That's one, um, and then more particularly in the more immediate, um, you know, some of you will know have seen that um, one of the bills that I'm uh, looking at introducing is a private members' bill 
on allowing judges the discretion to not impose mandatory minimum sentences because of the disproportionate impact on you're getting a rousing you round of help to get it through because you know part of the reason I'm doing it is the government uh, didn't do what was part of its platform um, was to actually introduce uh, to dismantle a number of the mandatory minimums so this bill and it will be tabled um, if not next week if not by Thursday or Friday of next week it'll be Monday the following week um, and it will basically allow that it was what Irwin, Irwin Kotler had initially um, suggested and then added into their um, not just sentences but also penalties so things like victim surcharge you know a number of the provisions that have already been um, knocked back by different courts um, so that's one piece the other is um, and um, my hope is through that it will expose a few things one it'll allow judges to not impose the mandatory minimum sentences and penalties but it will also then expose um, even more so the inequities of who may still be um, you know being sentenced to longer sentences and allow us then some court challenges on that basis so that's one piece another is um, uh, another private member's bill that I'm hoping again that the government will take on but it's not looking too promising so it probably will be tabled when we return you know when the the um, Senate resumes in the fall and it's a um, conviction expiry bill so instead of the record suspension that it currently has now instead of the part the old pardon process this would be a process that would go back to the timelines we had before but uh, try to do away, do away with the bureaucratic process of having to apply for a pardon or a record suspension or uh, a conviction expiry and um, do away with the application fee as well. So it would be an automatic process that basically um, when two years pops up after the end of a summary conviction uh, offense or conviction, uh, the end of the sentence, that it would people can basically say, I have no more conviction on this basis. Um, unless it's um, when it pops up there's been some other activity and the police have to investigate there will also be a provision and then then at five years for um, indictable there will also be a provision to have um, people be able to apply early so in particular you know those who are trying to get jobs that require them to cross borders um, is you know truck driving that sort of thing but also for women in particular but also men who have children who want to volunteer in schools or go on um, programs or you know other reasons that they might like to apply earlier for um, a record uh, or for a conviction expiry so that's another one and then you may have seen through the Senate Committee on Human Rights um, where actually you know one of my objectives is to get all of the senators to jail not in the way that they, you know, was looking like they might go previously, but um, some may belong but, there. <laughs> but actually, well, okay. well, I'll leave that to them to decide how okay. they go, in, you know, beyond that. But um, through the Senate Human Rights Committee, but also through Aboriginal Peoples, we've had visits um, into prisons, and one of the things I'm doing is ensuring that everybody goes into the segregation units as well as into. Um, the you know we've been into geriatric units we've been into the max units for women because those of you who work with women know that all women in federal penitentiaries who are classified as maximum security overwhelming majority of whom are indigenous um, growing number of whom particularly at Grand Valley are African Canadian um, are more likely to be in maximum security so they're living in a state of segregation or status of segregation separated from the rest of the jail population and it's interesting that most lawyers don't understand that. The lawyers who brought the cases, both in Ontario and in BC, um, didn't fully grasp it. I, I, I believe that's partly why um, groups would not go to the position of saying, eliminate segregation altogether, not just solitary confinement, and not just caps, the 15-day caps that the United Nations came up with, are actually based on what happens across the uh, around the globe. And 15 days um, has ended up being used almost like a minimum as opposed to a cap. And in any event, when we know what happens in the prisons for women and um, young people in particular, there's no excuse for that process. In fact, all the research for many, many decades has shown that, in fact, um, you know, most, most should be kept at low security. And it's been really the impact of the men's prisons on those that has resulted in the, the increased security and the, the processes. 
I personally think we could get rid of it for men as well, but um, people who work with men are saying that, you know, that's not true. I can tell you that just in the few visits, um, well, few, 10, 12 prison times I've visited since I was appointed, um, I actually think they're wrong. I think most people actually don't go into segregation, including those who do work in this area, and don't actually see the conditions and don't um, appreciate that it's overwhelmingly those who are um, in need of human interaction, particularly those with mental health issues who end up in those isolating conditions, yes. and that there have been instances in our country, um, in prisons for men, in prisons for women, in prisons for youth, where um, institutions have gone for extended periods without having the ability to segregate people, and they've accommodated. They've used dynamic security, human interventions, they've used um, you know, interactions involving other um, individuals, whether it's people serving prison Thank sentences you. and or outside people, and they've managed. And so... Thank you, uh, Senator Pate. That's, that's another uh, piece that through those committees, I'm hoping that we'll um, see both a decarceration and using yes. the current mechanisms that allow for people to be taken out of the prisons. For those of you who are lawyers or work in this area, Section 29, which allows those with mental health issues and health issues to be transferred out of the prisons. Thank um, you, Section Senator Pate. Which is geared specifically to Indigenous prisoners, but can also be applied to non-Indigenous prisoners. And really putting a focus on, for those who are already in prison, get rid of segregation. Senator Pate, are you possible. able to thank, hear me? Thank you, uh, Kim. Um, sorry. Oh, am I cause, out yeah. of time? Sorry. Because <laughs> I, I don't think you can hear us well. Um, so we can, she can only hear us if we speak from the That's podium. Fine. From the podium. Oh, yeah. I see. Oh, my okay. God. I'm sorry. Was I blathering on it? Oh, that's <laughs> okay. No. Someone stand that's up okay. and wave and say, shut up. I'm not <laughs> sorry about that. My apologies. I was going to say, I wouldn't call that blathering on. It's actually refreshing to know that there are senators who are doing some good work. <laughs> Um, and work that is really essential and that is going to affect and does affect so many of our communities. Obviously, we know that there has been a disturbing trend towards um, uh, greater rates of incarceration mm -hmm. of both African Canadians and Indigenous peoples. And we know that there is a whole host of issues, as you've raised um, in your response to us, um, that are affecting each one of our communities, but in different ways. Um, and so I'd like to ask um, the panel, before we move into what I hope will be a more fulsome conversation about us building on those relationships and developing healthy relationships with each other, where we can really both see the ways in which we are affected by the same systems negatively, adversely, but in different mm -hmm. fashions, um, how we can build and support each other in our respective struggles with regard to that. So I'd just like to ask uh, each of the panel members, and, and anyone can start, if in, in light of everything that has been said, mm -hmm. um, and you know, sometimes we can actually feel overwhelmed mm -hmm. knowing that, yes, we've read these reports, we've had these recommendations, we've been on the streets, we've been in those consultations. Um, we sometimes engage and then pull back in despair, recognizing that what we've done hasn't really worked that sometimes we, we win a victory. We mm -hmm. get the anti-racism directorate. We get the special investigations unit. We get a government that actually goes forward and implements employment equity. We get a government that finally calls a commission into missing and murdered indigenous women. And then yet somehow, even within those victories, there's still sometimes we see the flaws. And so, as Beverly reminds us that we have to work on both sometimes the systemic and imposed institutions that we deal with, we also have to go internally and dig into the knowledge, the resources, the wealth of information that we've drawn on as communities over many, many years and decades and centuries. How do we wrestle with all of those things in feeling that this is really a time and a moment where we could actually make some advances? Anybody want to take that? Well, I'm always of the, um, and I, I guess I work from the perspective that whenever we are 
given, whenever our demands are met, it's not um, often because um, the, those in power see that justice um, is needed and therefore just give um, a, a response to that demand. It is often because of the kind of activism and the kinds of conversations and convenings that happen in forums like this and elsewhere. Um, so therefore, I often see those gains as, as I said before, um, as fragile gains that we need to consistently um, struggle to keep. Um, and again, as Senator Payne said, it's a, again because it's, 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 it's sometimes, it can get awash with that four-year electoral cycle. Um, the other piece um, for me around, in terms of the gains that we get, um, and is a mindfulness that there are times when we are, when our demands for justice are met, but the intention that we have in seeking um, those demands is usually an intention that's tied to justice and equity um, and the principle of um, fairness. And sometimes they are given not with that as an accord, but that they are given as sometimes a way to, to placate, mm -hmm. to quiet, to mute further dissent and or demand. Mm -hmm. And we always need to therefore be vigilant um, in protecting um, the gains and, and defending to hold on to those gains. The one piece that I just want to comment on um, in Senator Payne's listing um, is we're in a moment where legalization is on the agenda. So when we talk about the prison industrial complex and when we talk about who are the populations that are disproportionately represented um, in the prison system and in the justice system is that in this context of a neoliberal conversation around um, legalization is that there is not at the same time a conversation that's attached to who have been the populations that have been more marginalized in the justice system because of issues related to substance use, issues related to um, you know, selling of marijuana um, within the justice system. It's been largely racialized, low-income communities. But what we have seen in the state's effort around legalization is that the people who are, who are about to profit from this are the <coughs> folks who, in fact, were some of the chief architects against legalization. Mm -hmm. So, I, and, and I speak the name of Chief Fantino. Yes. Yeah, specifically. So, so, so I think that, and I, and I use that as a concrete example to say there are things that we have fought for, legalization being one, low-income marginalized populations, and know that it's here, is that we will not, quote unquote, benefit from this, but also that those of us who have been caught and punished in that system where, illegal, where um, there was an, an illegal issue um, is that we will, not be, um, we will not be relieved of that punishment. Um, so a funny way how the state operates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the things too that has been really uh, impacted my way of thinking about how we address issues or how we overcome them is just really understanding the fact that in our current place and state where we are, we're, we're in an occupied state, right? We can't ex expect people or structures to perform as if colonialism isn't currently happening in the spaces and places where we are now. And so um, that has played, a, you know, been a really informing lens, right? Because we can't expect, uh, you know, indigenous women to operate as if they are, they are healed when they are currently under attack. We can't expect um, you know, these structures to operate in a way that is you know, proactively rights affirming when the very system demands that indigenous people must be subjugated within it to form legitimacy. So I think that those kinds of ideas are, are really important to contextualize a lot of this work because um, you know, indigenous peoples are currently displaced over having the ability to, to determine you know, what happens with their lands and, and how they um, you, you know, use 
views and and develop their cultures and practice their cultures within within the, the you know the space in which they are um, currently existing. Whether they are displaced from their their uh, homelands where they formed their cultures, or whether they're forming new ways of relating to one another in urban spaces. You know, those are there's a lot of dynamic spaces and, and how we relate to um, you know the different peoples that have come to the the land since. Um, contact and, and how we related to each other even before contact in our relationships to one another. And so I think that has been um, part of, you know, deserves to be a part of this because un unless we're able to understand, you know, both the legacy of past policy and legislation, but also the current state of laws, legislation, regulation, and practice that impacts communities, then we, we can never really, uh, you know, know what the issues are to be able to overcome them, right? And, and we're never going to get to a place where there's an understanding of the proactive affirmation of human rights, right? And the understanding that that, that basis of, um, you know, affirming other people's dignity and, and what Bev was talking to, right? This recognition and mutual affirming of one another in, in human dignity and in rights becomes uh, a, a mechanism that actually creates peace in our communities, you know, creates justice, you know, uh, you know, abolishes crime and, and does those types of things that we're all looking for with more punitive measures that aren't working. Um, so I think that that's part of, you know, uh, the flavor of the conversation we're having. We want to hear from the audience in a moment as well, but um, Rizwan, Beverly, did you want to respond? Sure, I, I'll go. Um, I think part of, part of the, uh, mm -hmm. the reality mm -hmm. is, uh, I mean, everything that, that we're talking mm -hmm. about is racism. Mm -hmm. Um, the reality of racism and systemic discrimination. Um, all of the current systems that we work in are colonial. Mm -hmm. The justice system, the prison system, the social system, the, the legal system, the health system, they're all uh, created by colonial law and um, so if we were to follow um, Gus Wenta, the two role and acknowledge that the systems we as indigenous people have never been able to um, have never been able to flourish in our own systems because we've had us had this outside colonial racist system that we have been forced into in every aspect and so so what i what i hope for is that this true relationship um, in understanding that we have a justice system that we have a health system that has been in existence before colonization and it has continued to this day mm -hmm. because we still have elders, we still have knowledge holders, we still have uh, language speakers, we still have uh, people who live off the land, people who still pick medicines, we still have our ceremonies that are year round and we still have, have our, our uh, are people who practice it and it's a whole different way of life it's a whole different way of life to practice our way of being it has nothing to do with the systems that are in existence at the present time so that's what that's what I've been focusing on it, it, it feels like um, we're, we're in this transition uh, of having to work within this colonial system to waken it up, wake up. Wake up because we have always been here and we're not going away. And those of us who have been uh, on the front lines in taking risks, um, taking those risks to ensure that 
our future generations are, are being looked after and that's the, the reason why we do what we do, why I do what I do. And, uh, but it's also understanding those basic principles of peace, trust, and friendship from, those are basic principles of the two row wampum belt. And so if we're to have those basic principles, it has to be on both sides. So uh, the other side, we, we need to know, we need to know exactly what that means. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so if there's trust, there seems, and it's only even within our own <coughs> systems, we've, we've lost trust even in ourselves because of the impacts of colonization. And there's a, been a lot of things that have happened as a result. So that's part of what's happening in the community is the empowerment in our own communities to say, I, I am, I am a, a strong Haudenosaunee person. I am a strong Anishinaabe person. And this is what I'm gonna do because this is what my ancestors have always done. And, um, and if it means standing on the land to protect the land, if it means standing um, in the water to protect the water, then that means that we're following our laws and that there's people who are responsible to do that. So then we need the respect on the other side to say they are, they are also protecting us. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a bigger picture. It is a bigger picture of humanity, of humanness, because those are, those are our teachings. Our teachings tell us that uh, as human beings, we aren't any different than a plant or a tree or the land, because everything has a spirit. And so all of us are responsible. So that's where that responsibility of everybody, every human being, uh, has a responsibility to that and so so for me it's it's a it's a real um, it's a, it's a struggle every day it feels like a struggle every day because having to um, see what's happening I live in my community at Six Nations and see what what's happening in the community with our young people and the the old, older people, it's also in my own generation of, you know, the addictions and, um, uh, and the losses and the impacts that are, that are really there. And to, to, to understand where I situate myself even at home and then also in spaces like this, um, to also educate <laughs> is, is uh, it's an everyday, nonstop, 24-hour job, um, even in my own home. I look after my dad, who is 83 years old, um, and uh, I look after my teenage grandchildren, who are 16 and 14. And so I have um, all those generations in my home and trying to maintain peace <laughs> and healthiness. <laughs> so there's lots of stuff, always. Mm -hmm. so you don't you. escape any of this no. stuff by going home. <laughs> no, not, not at all. Rizwan, did you want to make I, I would just like to add that um, I, I take the points uh, that Courtney and, and Angela and, and Beverly have raised. And um, I think one of the things that, that I'm seeing is when we speak of uh, gains and how to um, sustain the gains, how to continue the work, uh, regardless of what um, politicians are saying or trying to do. Um, I think uh, I get concerned about institutions um, in Muslim circles. And I think, um, you know, even though James and Agnes Love immigrated from Scotland to Canada before Confederation and the first Canadian Muslim was James Love Jr., um, the first of uh, 11 children, um, most of the Muslim, Muslim uh, Canadian or Canadian Muslim communities in, uh, in, um, are very new. And um, I'm, I'm part of, a, I'm the children of immigrants that came 
to Toronto. I was born in Toronto in, in the early 80s. And they, my parents came um, in the late 70s. And I had no Muslim classmates in public schools. I didn't know any Muslim people. I didn't have any books on Islam in English. And there's no internet. So uh, half the time, I thought whatever Islam was was whatever my parents were making up. And I was con constantly thinking, like, um, maybe Christianity is, like, legit. Like, this is how I should be. <laughs> and whatever Christianity was, it's not even something that I understood in, from books, again, or from scholars, uh, or from religious leaders. It was just, like, whatever my classmates were doing or whatever the teachers were doing. Because we used to say the Lord's Prayer uh, and then the National Anthem. So that was profoundly like just jarring for me. Um, in the wake of 9-11, uh, there's been a lot of challenges, but a lot more institution building. Because I think Muslims now are, are going into a phase where they're starting to see that to, to do the work that we need to do to push for the things that we need to push for, um, it's going to have to happen at the grassroots. And we're going to need institutions as vehicles to, to do this. The Canadian Council of Muslim Women is, uh, is a 35-year-old organization, but uh, there's very few organizations in Canada that can employ a person like me full time. So that when I, for example, uh, meet young Muslims that are concerned about uh, standing in the water with indigenous peoples, standing on the land with indigenous peoples, uh, demonstrating in the prairies uh, when um, the verdict came for the murder of Colton Bushi, who we're still very angry about. And I'm talking to Muslim, young Muslims in the prairies that are, and across the country, who are following not just the story of Colton Bushi and his family, but um, other crises that are, and other stories that are emerging. But when we look at who are the Muslims that are employed to actually follow up and follow through, uh, we don't have them right now. We're getting young Muslims pushed into hard sciences, STEM fields. Uh, and then they're pursuing jobs in other places. At the University of Toronto, an administrator told me that 50%, roughly, of Muslim students uh, that self-identify as Muslim on campus are international students. And when they form uh, organizations on campus to uh, build solidarity, to learn, to uh, build relationships with other campus clubs, they do so. Uh, in, uh, I, I uh, uh, regret kind of uh, this situation, but I just want to say um, to, to acknowledge the, the, what the situation actually is right now, is a lot of the students organize along uh, very classist frameworks that render them blind to uh, the needs, uh, the opportunities that they have to build with uh, indigenous students, with black students, with other students that um, they would have a lot in common with, mm -hmm. and that beyond school that they need to work with. Um, so so I'm continue, uh, I continue to be very concerned about that, and I continue to push for more institution building work uh, so that we can have counterparts uh, for uh, the people that we want to continue to work with to press for progress. Um, I know we do have some mics in the audience. So if there are some people who have questions and want to uh, pose them or make some comments regarding uh, our conversation, um, you can move to the mics uh, at this time. Um, but I'll also, I'll just ask Senator Pate, can you hear us? Uh, yes, sorry, oh, yes. just call me Kim. Oh, I, Kim. If ever it looks like I like that Senator thing too, I really <laughs> want to be down. <laughs> Thanks very much. So um, as we've been talking, we've been hearing about, um, you know, the need for us to continue to, to reflect on our own sources of power within grassroots organizations and so on, and um, to figure out how we build on some of the successes of the past as we continue forward. But also we're talking, and I, wanted, I don't want to miss this conversation or end this conversation without us having a conversation about um, those healthy relationships and that building of solidarity, the building of coalitions um, across our differences. And especially um, at this particular juncture in time when we know that there has uh, been 
an opening, if you will, in a conversation where the mainstream has talked to us about quickly jumping to reconciliation, but not so much talking about our ongoing participation in a colonial project. Not so much, we've been, we've been called visible minorities, we've been called people of color, we've been called allies on occasion, but we haven't wrestled, many of us, um, with our, our sometimes unwilling but very real participation in this colonial project as settlers, as immigrants um, who uh, haven't taken the time to learn those stories, learn that history, and also understand the current realities as they continue. So from your vantage point as somebody who's worked in both um, the grassroots communities as well as now in your new role, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I really, I, I think the issues around the importance of decolonizing are vital. Um, it's, in, it's always interesting to me um, to hear what that means to different hmm. individuals and groups. Mm -hmm. And for instance, the area that I, I'll focus on the area that I'm, I'm most familiar with, the, uh, because I defer to all of you on the areas that you're, um, you know well, but in terms of the so-called criminal or injustice system in the prison industrial complex, we know that most of the efforts to actually address issues for, the, for um, racialized um, peoples in the system have essentially involved just taking the system and having new people administer it as opposed to dismantling or decolonizing the system. And I think our, that you know, I've off, you know, it's not an original thought, but the, the idea of the love affair with crime and punishment is something that I think we could really start to dismantle. And every organization will have um, represented there. I'm, I'm, um, I'm quite confident, I, but, you know, I could be wrong. So, you know, let me know if I am. But I, I suspect every group um, represented at this conference, at this gathering, have members of the commu their communities who incarcerated, who are criminalized and incarcerated. There are mecha mechanisms right now to decarcerate those individuals. But what, it, what the government requires at the moment is that you set up um, a, basically a process that just involves a new way, and usually in their mind a cheaper way of incarcerating. So the sections that I was talking about under the Corrections and Conditional Release Act um, allow for that. Some of the legal interns that are working with us this summer are actually working on developing FACTA so that we can actually do some legal challenges. We're looking for communities who want to challenge, who want to claim um, individuals who are currently in prison, um, return them to their communities, or to, in some cases, some of the indigenous communities we're talking to want to do reciprocal arrangements if someone's not welcome in their home community because of um, what led them to be in the system, then a reciprocal arrangement so that they, another community might sponsor them. And certainly Six Nations, um, Bev will know well, has, um, has done this already with individuals who couldn't go back to their home communities. What hasn't happened, though, is, is up until now, um, most everybody has accepted the strictures, the procedures, the policies that Corrections has put in place for how those kinds of agreements can happen. Those strictures, those procedures, those policies all violate the law. And so we're actually in developing the materials so that individuals and in or groups that want to sponsor people back to the community could actually do legal challenges. And we're, so we're, we're trying to mount some of those. And you might think, well, that doesn't sound like decolonizing. And you're, you're right, it's using um, the law to, uh, but one of the things that we'll do is, particularly if we start with women, um, there are uh, uh, just under 700 women serving federal sentences. 39% of them are Indigenous, about 11% are African Canadian, and about another 3 4% are, um, unfortunately, it's put in a, the mass of other uh, in terms of racialized, but the majority of women in prison are racialized. Mm -hmm. If we decarcerated even a tenth of those let next year, um, the minimum amount that communities could claim would be, let's say, half of what is currently being uh, is being used to incarcerate them. 
And there's nothing in the law that stipulates what has to happen when a community welcomes someone back to hold them accountable in their community. And so that's $100,000 per person. That could buy, that could, you know, build a lot of houses. It could develop, um, you know, supports and jobs for other people to provide support in the community to deal with past trauma because 91% of the indigenous women, 87% of the women overall have histories of physical and or sexual abuse. More than 80% of them are in for um, trying for, you know, charges that emanate from their behavior as they're trying to negotiate poverty. Um, if you're talking about indigenous women who are then in maximum security again, which is about half of them, and again, um, African Canadian women are overrepresented there too. You're talking in excess of six hundred thousand dollars per year. And again, nothing in the law prevents us from actually developing those arrangements um, for maximum security women. And in fact, most of those women who are labeled maximum security are because of how they responded to violence, often um, violence that's been perpetrated against them. Some of it defensive, but mo you know, almost all of it reactive. And then um, we could be looking at very different approaches to people being in the community and resources actually immediately being reallocated in some of those ways. So for me, um, that provides, I think, a way for communities to decolonize. And the, the model that I'm a bit familiar with is some of the Maori in, um, in New Zealand when um, some of the women in um, some of the communities took control of what they called family group conferencing, mm -hmm. what they did was they took the resources and they started building first support and recreation programs and childcare for kids. Then they developed a kindergarten, then a high school or, or elementary school, then a high school. And now they're working on a college and university. And all of that has not surprising to anybody there, any of you, um, as the education rates went up, as supports went up for individuals in the community, all the crime rates went down, health costs went down, and um, you have basically thriving communities starting to develop. And so I think we could be looking at some of those, taking lessons from some of those areas, but those are just some, some ideas. And, you know, last year or two years ago when um, Canada was asked to, um, you know, welcome in 25,000 um, people from Syria, that was great. Why, why can't we do the same with people from prison? and free up all you know, billions of dollars that are currently being spent in that area and dismantle that um, process in the, at the same time. Thank you. Um, others, uh, what, do you, what does the word reconciliation that, we've, that the mainstream has quickly jumped to evoke for you? What do we need to be thinking about as we move forward with this forum? Um, I think that there's two kinds of ideas that are embedded with that idea of reconciliation. It's kind of like the lofty principle of reconciliation and then the, the, the emerging policy sphere that is reconciliation and the emerging federal government uh, guided nation to nation or government to government relationship with uh, different indigenous organizations. And those two things are, are quite distinct. And when we talk about you know, the approach that the federal government has taken within this, um, we know that he has deliberately excluded women from this conversation. Um, it's something that's documented in the news, but how he talks about, you know, there's a distinction-based approach that needs to happen when it comes to reconciliation, and it's along the lines of the Aboriginal definition of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, and the national organizations that are represented within those, right? It's not um, organizations that Indigenous communities have formed themselves. It's not Indigenous-led women's organizations, um, like the one that I currently work for. It, it's not those things, and there's, and there's been no space carved out for us to be involved in, in the decision-making on how this rolls out, right? There's a, a legacy of an embedded sexism in the, the rollout of some policy initiatives that marginalize the voices of, of women within that, right? And, and Indigenous women especially are being asked to endure the legacy of sex um, for this broader push for racial equality. And so for me, that's really, you know, how the reconciliation is playing out. Um, you know, women are deliberately being excluded by both the government and by, you know, indigenous organizations from being able to have this full role in decision making and agenda setting on what that looks like. Um, you'll see that um, a lot of the conversations that are, that are being had are, are with um, only men at the table. And that's... Uh, 
very upsetting in a lot of ways because a lot of this leverage and, and push for equality for Indigenous people has been led by Indigenous women. Mm -hmm. And certainly the, uh, the emergence and the, the push from the last federal government was around, you know, campaigning about the inquiry and justice for Indigenous mm -hmm. women. And that was hard fought um, advocacy from a lot of families and um, in memory of their missing and, and murdered uh, family members who are women. And, and that, um, that has been really discouraging. And so I think that that um, is a very specific way that it has played out. And then I worry more broadly about reconciliation uh, being the way in which uh, that reconciliation becomes a mechanism where indigenous knowledge is, it becomes affirmed for the purposes of being extracted. And that the most marginalized within our communities don't actually benefit from a change in practice that has that is the product of um, their cultures that have been denied to them. And so I think that those are two pieces, right? That that there's this uh, uh, evolving idea of of honoring indigenous knowledge, of using indigenous methodologies, and, and bringing that to the mainstream, while leaving the most marginalized indigenous communities behind. And they're not actually increasing their own knowledge or practice of of what's happening um, within their own knowledge systems, right? We still have marginalized. Uh, people that don't have connections to their culture and language and identity who are the most impacted um, by colonialism in our communities. They are displaced from their lands and their families. And um, there's been no real meaningful way on how to um, rematriate those people into our communities and into our families. And that's been, um, I think, one of the most uh, alarming things for me mm -hmm. is that we haven't seen that, uh, that healing or restoration for indigenous communities be the priority. Mm -hmm and that's lacked in the practical knowledge, right? So that pieces, right? And so I think that that, um, you know, I'm, it's not an optimistic view of reconciliation <laughs> by any means. I'm not trying to, to uh, put that forward, but I think that, you know, this conversation as it plays out is, is definitely complex, right? And there's this idea that, um, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for all the great work that they've done, they've done, it has, didn't name the restoration of the role of parents as a recommendation mm -hmm. for, for their work, right? And so we see that, you know, indigenous communities are, are most likely female-headed, um, there are single mothers who are raising children, and there was never a role in the adult mm -hmm. woman and her role in her communities and the restoration of that role as a part of truth and reconciliation. And I think it's another, instance in which um, you know indigenous women are being asked to endure sexism for this broader advancement of their communities and um, our women are doing it because they they value their communities and they'll put their communities before themselves and um, I'm glad to be with an organization that says they deserve to have mm -hmm. their perspective centered first Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, um, I would say as an immigrant is that we need to be, as, as an immigrant in this space, is that we need to be very um, cautious about how we are called upon to affirm what is currently defined as reconciliation mm -hmm. because we have been called upon to participate in the multicultural project before reconciliation, mm -hmm. which was a project that we were called upon to be complicit in the erasure of indigenous people's place, mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and that I, I am angst mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that the reconciliation project that's led by the state is not, is not, is not consistently embedded in a decolonization project. Mm -hmm and that uh, mm. we will be called upon later to say that we have reconciliation and that has been done. Mm -hmm. So therefore, let's why are on. we, let's move yeah. on. Mm -hmm. um, but we have not dealt with the decolonization project. And I think that we who are often called upon to um, use um, symbols that have now become attached to reconciliation, so we do land acknowledgement. And I get angst that we are using land acknowledgement as it is an important and affirming um, offering, but it cannot be divorced from the present reality 
of, a colon, of Canada's colonization project. And that sometimes it has, it's now becoming rote. Mm -hmm. And I fear when I see it becoming rote without it being grounded in a decolonization project, mm -hmm. I, I, there's something that rises up in me that says, mm, there's, something, there's something here that's not right that we're being called upon to participate in. And what I go to is I go to the reconciliation project that we saw in South Africa, post-apartheid, when a number of mothers, <laughs> women in communities, were called upon to sit at tables to speak to their experience of horrific abuse under apartheid. And at the end of that, South Africa can claim that they had a truth and reconciliation project, but the place of women and those women who spoke have not changed significantly, and those women still experience some of the highest level of violence and poverty, but yet we've had truth and reconciliation. Right. So I am just asked. I want to thank uh, Courtney for um, emphasizing the difference between the ideal mm -hmm. or the abstract mm -hmm. notion of reconciliation and uh, the emerging policy sphere around that. Uh, I, I'm interested in a deeper conversation of the nitty gritty of that because I think uh, the exclusion of women and the marginalization of women in agenda setting, decision making at high levels is, is uh, something the Canadian Council of Muslim Women would be very, very concerned about and uh, want to explore ways to contribute to mitigating uh, that problem. Um, I would also like to say that uh, working with Muslim youth right now across Canada, I'm very concerned that we uh, tend to do the land acknowledgement and uh, not have any clue what to do after that <laughs> or how to build on that, how to connect to indigenous elders, uh, people like uh, who are the uh, keepers of traditional knowledge of, of history, of heritage, of language, uh, like uh, Elder Ernie and others, and um, um, Beverly as well, and other people that uh, you can come to know. I, I, I hear sometimes, okay, so going back to the whole multiculturalism um, uh, colonial uh, project that we, we ended up uh, getting uh, suckered into, um, I think that although the, uh, there's been lasting damage uh, fr from first generation um, uh, uh, Canadian Muslims uh, who've experienced this, uh, the, uh, the parents and young people that are, it's, it's continuing damage that's happening, um, that's obstructing our, our ability to see what's, what this really is and what it means. Um, I think there is an opportunity here because a lot of our parents um, uh, were not ideologically committed to multiculturalism. It was sort of like uh, adopting the, the, the dialect so to speak, of, of what was expected for you to say. And so, um, although there was complicity and participation in, in this damage and in this harm, uh, this, their, their children are starting to realize uh, we need to focus on decolonization. And actually, the way that our families have suffered from uh, colonial projects around the world um, is not unlike how uh, their distinctive features of how colonization and, and colonial uh, harm has worked in, in, in this country, um, in these lands, but um, there's some common patterns as well. And so there's, there's a basis for solidarity um, in terms of uh, traditional principles, but also uh, other material dimensions to this as well. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of interested in sort of seeing how can uh, educators and uh, community-based educators work with young people to sort of help them get um, access to the uh, elders and the resources and the leaders, especially uh, women um, who can provide guidance for them. Um, I think uh, part of this involves us focusing on the point that you were making earlier, Beverly, about holistic uh, approaches to this and also what health means and also uh, looking at responsibilities 
Um, and I think if so right now we're so preoccupied with, and you know, reasonably, I think there's a reasonable preoccupation with rights, um, especially for, for Muslim women that are experiencing gendered Islamophobia, um, and for uh, black Muslim women that are experiencing gendered anti-black Islamophobia, um, I, I think it's, it's uh, we're in a place where uh, Dr. Abdul Hakim Jackson, uh, an American Muslim, black American Muslim theologian said, how do we speak truth to pain right now? We're sort of grappling with that. Um, so, so I welcome guidance about that as well. Well, that's a good lead in to what I was gonna say about uh, reconciliation is about the truth. Um, the truth of, of the colonial history of the current forms of, of colonization. Um, and because my focus has been in law, and even though um, holistically that means, that means every, every living thing. So when it comes to the land and we're talking about decolonizing, Canada, needs to acknowledge its role in uh, decolonizing um, the land. Um, their law uh, has used colonial concepts like the doctrine of discovery, mm -hmm. um, terra nullius, to justify their uh, ownership of indigenous lands and territories. Treaties, treaties were about nation to nation relationships. They never implemented those treaties. The treaties were never implemented. They created the Indian Act um, and to control land, reserve land. And I know that there's been a conversation about um, getting rid of the Indian Act. Um, I know my community would jump for joy for that, but there's still conflict in the community. There's still conflict about whether we continue with the Indian Act because we've been controlled for so many years um, that coming out of that control process, again, is about our own strength and empowerment. So, so when we're talking about all of these uh, processes of, of reconciliation, and it's not just words. Um, you can say lots of words, and I've been around. <laughs> In the political system, uh, I've heard lots of words. I've heard lots of things being said, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll, I'll change. It sounds like an, an abusive partner. I'll change, I will, mm -hmm. um, but it's the action, right? It's, I mean, that was my response to the residential school apology. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you gonna do about it, mm -hmm. right? An abuser can still uh, punch you and kick you and beat the crap out of you while they're saying they're sorry. So it's, it's, the, it's the action that comes with reconciliation. And, uh, and we need our allies, right? We need, we need those allies, we need the solidarity, we need to ensure that we have um, the acknowledgement of everyone's responsibility to me that that's the key. Um, you know, where I've been raised, I was, um, I'm a Haudenosaunee Mohawk woman, and I know that um, the strength of our women is rooted in our blood and our connection to the land. And um, I know I can hear my ancestors tell me to stand up and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to say what needs to be said. And I have one of my Mohawk mentors <laughs> sitting in the audience. 
Sylvia Merkel, who taught me how to speak up. Uh, my, my sister, my Mohawk sister, Patricia Montour, is no longer here with us, but I can hear her and see her in front of me saying, speak up, say something, don't be afraid, don't, don't be afraid to say what needs to be said. And um, because we have that responsibility for those future generations. So, and I, you know, respect, um, the multicultural, <laughs> but it's about nationhood. It's about uh, where you come from. It's about, as a woman, where you come from, as a man, where you come from, your roots and your responsibilities. And I'll always come back, right back to that again about, about those healthy relationships. It was, uh, that was a really strong message um, in everything that I've been doing lately, so. Well, Beverly, you've offered us a wonderful way to conclude our um, panel discussion today because I, I opened the panel by saying I was afraid, <laughs> not knowing of the time that we face, but also acknowledging that there's much for us to be hopeful about and there's much for us to build on in terms of those relationships. So in thinking about the rights and responsibilities that we have um, and that we need to fight for, the work that has and has not been done, the challenges that we face, the possibilities that are ahead and the actions that we need to take. There's much work um, ahead of us to reflect on and think about, but I wanna thank, and I'm asking you to join me in thanking our panel members, um, Beverly, Rizwan, Kim, Angela, and Courtney very much in leading us in this conversation tonight. Thank you very much. And please join me in thanking Kike for doing an excellent job as our moderator. Please, stay seated, stay seated. We have a treat for you and I'm asking our panelists to just stay on stage um, for our last wrap up. And it's a thrill, thrill, thrill that we have for you to welcome our young poet who will be blessing us with two of her poems. Amani, will you join me on stage please? Amani Omar is a youth born and raised in Toronto. She has a passion for creative arts and aspires to be an artist in the future. Currently, Amani is a high school student residing in Hamilton, Ontario, where she is working towards attending an art school while still pursuing her love of poetry. Amani, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, everyone. I'd first like to just thank our panel. You are such strong and driven people and I wish you all the best. Hope you achieve all your goals in the future. I'd also like to thank Michael Kerr who has invited me to this event and all the people involved. As a disabled black visibly Muslim Girl, I do feel happy seeing organizations like Color of Poverty, Color of Change, opening the conversation with people who want to be educated and who are hungry for knowledge and change. And to be a part of this is great. I've prepared two poems which I believe will touch a bit on the thoughts of youth. I remember in grade six, everyone used to use the word racist with such ease without understanding what it meant. But as my generation has become more aware of the problems of the world, we realize how par powerless we may be. This first poem is called Color. It is from my perspective, the perspective of a youth. So I do hope you enjoy. We talk about racism, yet today it is a word we throw around so simply. And if something goes wrong, someone yells, racist. They say racist, yet in the time when you see someone on the street whose face is not the same as yours, you turn your back to the injustice. You turn your back on the racist. The day you are born into this world, the color of your skin decides how you will fight and if you are to win, but that's only if you're white. <laughs> 
Because if you are born with the deep brown color of your skin, you are not the one to win. And as you begin this race, you see the difficulties you will face as your hands are tied, feet are bind, the weight of the world on over your head. And the whispers that don't seem to be too quiet, speaking in your ear, telling you you're not light enough, not bright enough, not beautiful, they say you can't win. Yet they hide these words with a good luck and let's begin. And as the race starts, you're wondering how you will win when your hands have been brought to your knees and hands, and your knees, wait, sorry. When you've been brought to your knees and hands shackled, you were never meant to win, but they pretend it's equality. But you know this race is only a formality to show who's in charge. We talk about color and how it controls our lives, yet if we strip away color, we would only be left with values, yet these values seem only to be dull in comparison to the brilliant shade of white we all aspire to be as we bleach our skin, burn it till we're white enough, bright enough to be called beautiful. When you are born into this world, you are told what type of life you are to live given stereotypes like stickers that students get when they are rewarded, yet it is not a reward but a burden you must live with. When you are born into this world, the color of your skin dictates where you live, where you work, and if your dreams will ever be attainable. It decides if you'll be able to reach the sky or if you'll be six feet under the next day. And as much as you try to remove these shackles that have been placed on you, this cloud of doubt, they never seem to disappear because society tells you you're not good enough. Over and over, you believe it, surrendering to the injustice, surrendering to the racist, because we know that the day you were born, you probably didn't know that everything was decided for you. The day you were born, the color of your skin decided what life you were to live, what education you'd have, what home you'd live in, and whether you'd be able to reach high into the sky and grab your dreams, or if you'll be six feet under the next day. We talk about racism. Yet today, it is a word we throw around so simply. And if something goes wrong, someone yells, racist. They say you're racist, yet in the time when you see someone on the street whose face is not the same as yours, acting as if they were invisible, you turn your back to the injustice. You turn your back on the racist. Thank you. So this next poem, some may have heard at the event at Regent Park called Healing as One, where we came together and talked about the recent shooting in Toronto. I believe change is a form of healing. We move forward, do better, learn more, and I believe everyone here wants change. They have something they want to change. I do feel very proud about this poem, so enjoy. <laughs> Change. Is it the words you speak, the thoughts you think, the ideas you share, or is it the actions you do? What is change? Is it the dream things you dream about? Is it the ideals that shape your life? Is it the things you look forward to in the future? What is change? See, for a bird stuck in a cage, unable to be free, the definition of change is the ability to move forward through the pains and difficulties of the future. Change is the ability to heal broken wounds of the past as you let your wings guide you to the vast unknown. Change is like a caged bird finally stepping out of its shackles and joining the flock, making the best of what he has, trying his hardest to be free. Change is freedom. Change is everything. Change is your past, present, and future all coexisting in one place, ever helping each other, being there for each other to be a better you. What is change? Is it the words you speak? Is it the thoughts you share? The ideas that roam across your mind? Is it the new adventures, new dreams, new people, new challenges? What is change? Change is freedom. Change is everything and more. Change is past, present, and future. And most of all, change is you. Thank you. Amani Omar.
thank you, thank you, thank you, Amani. Thank you once again to our panelists, Kike, for being a wonderful moderator. Bev, Rizwan, Angela, Courtney, and Kim, thank you so much. You've given us much thought going into our all-day conference tomorrow. Kim, thank you for staying and joining us and for the work you continue to do at the Senate. And I hope to see the rest of our panelists here tomorrow so we can continue our conversations. And thank you for your patience. Looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. There is food outside, so please stay, mingle, chat with each other, eat good food, have some soft drinks, and come back tomorrow morning, and we'll continue our conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. We're going to disconnect you now. <laughs>